I'd like to begin by honoring the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands are where we stand, specifically the Multnomah, the Clackamas, the Tombwater, the Kaslamet, the Wallala Bands of the Chinook, and the Tualatin Kalapuya peoples, and also the many other indigenous nations along the Columbia River. I would also like to acknowledge that settler colonialism in the United States is not an event that ended in the past, but rather a structure of violence that continues to reproduce itself on the theft of indigenous lands and on the erasure and genocide of indigenous bodies. And so for us living on lands that we are not indigenous to, we do assist um, in maintaining and upholding the structure of violence by doing so. That being said, my name is Reed Gustafson. Um, I hope everyone's doing good tonight. On my mother's side, I'm enrolled with the Kaweka tribe and a descendant of the Comanche tribe. And on my father's side, I'm Swedish American. On my mother's side, we're of the Corn and the Sun clans, and our Kaweka homeland is located about 40 miles west of so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico, and you can see our territory in the photograph behind me. Today, I would like to discuss how settler colonial assimilation processes targeted the intimate natures of indigenous peoples. Beyond removing indigenous children from their homes and cultures and putting them in boarding schools in order to program their minds, Settler colonial assimilation processes look to impose heteronormative Christian monogamy on indigenous communities in the hopes to change sexual practices, familial structures, gender norms, and power dynamics within these communities. Ultimately, the goal, though, was to assimilate indigenous peoples and erase them in order to complete the settler colonial project. Um, my work around this topic is very much indebted to the work of indigenous studies scholars and indigenous writers. I would like to thank uh, Hoesta Moihane, Kim Talbert, uh, Chris Finley, Quo Lee Driscoll, Linda Tuahi Smith, Leslie Marmon Soko, and Paula Gunn Allen for helping shape my lens for analysis on this topic. Today's talk will be grounded in two-spirit scholarship, which understands an inextricable link between heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism, and also understands this link to be an important site for indigenous critique and decolonial praxis. And so today's talk will largely be a critique of three important federal Indian policy acts, the Dawes Act, the Indian Reorganization Act, and the Indian Relocation Act. Um, this critique will look at how these acts serve to impose heteropatriarchy on the communities affected. And then the end of this talk will be a look at how we can think about moving beyond settler sex and family as a resurgence practice, and also as a practice that has uh, implications for sustainable futures for generations to come. In 1887, the US government passed the Dawes Act, also known as the Allotment Act. This act, sir, or excuse me, this act gave the President of the United States the powers to survey indigenous land, which at this time was held in common. Once the land was surveyed, then it was divided into individual private property plots, and these plots were distributed to native male head of households. At this time, the native male would also become US citizen. Many scholars have written about how this act served as a settler land grab, and this is because um, after the land was distributed to the native males, the surplus land was then sold off to settler populations. And you can see an advertisement for this in the photograph behind me. However, not as many scholars have written about how this act also served to impose heteropatriarchy on the communities that were affected by it. Um, so for indigenous communities that didn't necessarily practice heteronormative nuclear family structures, they were uh, coerced into reordering themselves into families with one man and one woman in order to keep the land that they had been living on. And secondly, there was a gendered power shift towards heteropatriarchy because of this act. Um, this was because uh, as I said, the native male head of household would now be in control of the newly established property and also have expanded political rights as U.S. citizens. In 1934, the U.S. government passed the Indian Reorganization Act, which served to impose Western-style representational models of government on indigenous communities. Um, these newly established tribal councils largely mirrored American government where males were in positions of power. Um, so for indigenous communities who spread power horizontally between genders, there was a gendered power shift because these newly, newly established tribal councils were largely staffed by males. And also native males were able to internalize and benefit from this new power and um, it benefits them to continue to uphold this structure. <clears throat> 
1956, the U.S. government passed the Indian Relocation Act, which served to remove indigenous peoples from reservation land and move them into urban centers. At this time, the U.S. government was decreasing its funding for um, populations living on reservations while increasing its funding to actual uh, relocation funds and job training in order to assimilate indigenous peoples into Western capitalism. At this time, on reservation land, kinship structures were largely still in place. Um, so removing indigenous people from kinship and moving them into urban centers where the normative family structure was heteronormative and nuclear operated to assimilate indigenous peoples into this way of being. And furthermore, there's also a gendered power shift with this act as well, because indigenous peoples were moving into the gendered workforce of the 1950s, where hiring practices largely favored men in the workplace, um, as the breadwinners and women were uh, relegated to the home as homemakers. And so for indigenous communities that didn't necessarily have these strict divisions of labor and uh, gender roles, in order for them to have any bit of success within urban centers, they had to assimilate into um, this Western capitalist kind of way of being. Now that I've discussed the Indian Reorganization Act, the Indian Relocation Act, and the Dawes Act, I'd like to turn to a discussion of what indigenous studies scholars are saying have been some of the consequences and how indigenous studies scholars are looking at moving beyond settler sex and family as a resurgence practice. Indigenous studies scholar Chris Finley, who is a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes, uh, states in her article, Decolonizing the Queer Native Body, that um, we can use Michel Foucault's theorization of sexuality as a site for the enactment of state power to look at the imposition of heteropatriarchy on indigenous communities. Heter heteropatriarchy is a structure on um, communities or society which favors and prioritizes the male gender and also heterosexuality and subjugates all other subject positions and ways of being. So for indigenous communities that didn't necessarily have this strict structure in place, it was necessary for the government to impose that in order to assimilate them into Western American culture. Um, but the ultimate goal of this was to erase indigenous peoples in order to complete the settler colonial project. Uh, Kim Tallbearer also tells us that indigenous sexualities were always characterized as deviant or morally transgressive by U.S. colonizers. And this was kind of an important belief that justified colonialism because if native peoples were unable to um, govern themselves in the most intimate ways, then they were unable to govern themselves at all. And so um, this kind of justified the entirety of the settler colonial project. Finley also tells us that um, up until recently, Native scholars have largely remained silent um, with engaging discourses of sexuality when the, within their critiques of colonialism. And this is because sexual violence has been used as a weapon against Native peoples for hundreds of years. And so um, in order to protect ourselves, we've gone quiet. But Finley calls on Native studies scholars to engage discourses of sexuality in their uh, critiques of colonialism. She asks us, can we truly decolonize ourselves without taking colonial discourses of sexuality seriously? Kim Tallbear, who is enrolled with the Sesestan Wampatano Yate and a descendant of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, responds to Tallbear's uh, question in her article, Making Love and Relations Beyond Settler Sex and Family. Tall Bear states that if we truly consider everything in our life to be interconnected, then we must take seriously the implications that monogamy has on our desires to hoard resources, on our desires to objectify human beings, and that monogamy may be ca um, caustic and detrimental to communal life. Tall Bear theorizes that if heteronormative monogamy is kind of the basic relational building block within a society, um, then the idea is that you can hoard another human and Tall Bear thinks that this idea spreads into a vast misuse of resources and hoarding of resources. Tall Bear's research looks at Western societies that, um, as a normative practice, use heteronormative monogamy, and these are the societies that are using a vast amount of the world's resources at an unsustainable level. So Tall Bear asks us to rethink our relations with specific goals in mind. She asks us to use specific guidelines, and these guidelines are to um, center relationality in our relations, to um, ensure that pa uh, power is being shared reciprocally in our relations by all members, um, to use our intimacies to heal ourselves and others rather than hurt, 
and to make sure that our relations operate to build and maintain strong community. So in conclusion, today I've briefly discussed how the Dawes Act, the Indian Reorganization Act, and the Indian Relocation Act all serve to impose heteropatriarchy on indigenous communities. Um, I hope that I brought to light that settler colonialism is not just the theft of indigenous land, but it also um, includes imposing very specific sexual norms, uh, gender norms, power dynamics, and family structures on indigenous peoples in order to assimilate them. Moving forward, I think we can look at moving beyond settler sexuality as an indigenous resurgence practice or also a practice for non-native peoples who are concerned with sustainable futures. I'd like to recap the guidelines that Tall Bear gives us for reevaluating our, re our relations. Tall Bear asks us to ask ourselves if our relations operate to strengthen relationality, if they operate to build and maintain strong community, if we're healing with our intimacies rather than hurting, and if we are sharing power reciprocally in our relations. And if we're not, Tall Bear thinks that we should find new ways to relate to each other. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with a, a quote by Tall Bear, um, where she gives us a couple of specific steps that we can take moving forward if we're serious about moving beyond settler sex and family. Decolonization is not an individual choice. We must collectively oppose the system of compulsory settler sexuality and family that continues building a nation upon indigenous genocide and that marks indigenous and other marginalized relations as deviant. This includes opposing norms and supporting living within or supporting those living within non-monogamous bonds. It includes advocating policies that support a more expansive definition of family and not rewarding normative family structures with social and financial benefits. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and especially um, my close friends who were able to make it, um, so thank you.